Hi again, this is Bev from Skibbereen Speakeasy introducing another fantastic lineup of online performances. First up this time is Attractor Fahi, an award winning poet who was voted the Irish Times Newcomer of the Year last year and is reading from her new book of poems, Dinner in the Fields. Secondly, more mystical Celtic storytelling involving wolves from the bandom based Ray McKinley. And last but not least, John Devoy. A travel writer extraordinaire who um, features in a documentary about the writing of his own book Quandam Travels in a Once World which is about John's journey across Africa by bicycle. So sit back and enjoy and we look forward to seeing you again. Hello everybody. It's lovely to be with you this evening. I had initially hoped I'd be there in West Cork and um, meet you all um, when Paul uh, invited me to be a reader at um, one of the sessions. But we are, we're connecting in this way and, and I mean, obviously given the circumstances, um, the reading had to be canceled, but it's lovely that we can connect in this way. So Paul asked me if we could do a recording and um, have a virtual session and so that's what um, I'm going to try and do. I'm not very good at this. I think I have just recorded myself reading a poem once before. So um, <clears throat> if you can bear with me, I will read a few poems from my chapbook. This is my chapbook, um, Dinner in the Fields. And it was just published last month by um, Fly on the Wall Poetry Press. So if you'd like to order my book, you can order directly from the publisher or you can um, order it from Amazon or direct message me and I will um, send it on. So um, I'm going to read three poems from this and just to say before I start, I suppose I only really started writing um, when submitting my work in the last three years. I always loved writing. Um, it was sort of something I loved doing as a child. It was like the world of imagination and it was a way for me to keep my internal world separate to the external. Um, I had six siblings, so there was nine of us um, in our home. And so there was, I, I learned to be very sociable, but I liked this aloneness. And it was, I think what I write from now, I'm saying that because it's probably what influences me most. It was that inner world and, and that never changed. I think that we don't go that far from our roots. Um, and where my children inspire me and my work, I work as a psychotherapist, inspires me. I think the inspiration is always the foundation of where I can. I grew up at the top of a hill on, on a farm between two graveyards. So there was a lot of archaeological sites and um, you know, a 17th century graveyard and church. and. <clears throat> all of that was around me. So that's where I wandered, you know, um, the old walls, all the stories that's behind it, you know, there's something very spiritual and mystical about that. So I had that in me, despite being, you know, quite extrovert in another way. Um, and I managed to keep that quite hidden. So poetry was, a, or writing was a release, and I did write poems as a child. Then I got into more writing in my journal. And as my children got older, I, I, I felt drawn back to do something for myself. Um, I felt a need to, and this opportunity came because I also, I needed to do a master's for my work in psychotherapy um, because things were changing and evolving there. So I made a decision to do a master's that, that integrated both my own inner soul and um, the qualification I needed for my work. So I graduated in 2017 and towards the end of that year I began to send out poems. And the first poem I'm going to read um, is a poem, is, is one of the first poems to be published. Um, not the first, but one of the first. And it, it, it speaks of my childhood really, that graveyard my own ancestors would have been buried there. So this poem is from, from that, and it's called Our Sleeping Women. <clears throat> Our Sleeping Women. 
I think of my grandmothers, their faces etched in mine. Their strength sleeps in my bones. We meet in fields of crows. Their voices speak through wind. Old graves slope down from our farm. As a child, I played house, tea sets on tunes, innocent, listening to spirits. Daughters left to work with the duty not to themselves, but to others who cared little for the objects they'd become. From the clay they cry the song of the crone, dreams of the life unlived. Hope moves in the soil beneath my feet, rises in my breath. They call, willing me on with their work. Don't listen to scavengers who have taken your use. They're fear ripping your pleasure. Scream yourself into your body. Starve if you need until you're hurt. Your face ours, your womb creator, the only real home yourself. So that's called Our Sleeping Women and that um, poem was published first by Banshee and later by um, in Pothead. So the next poem I'm going to read is a poem that is uh, the voice, um, I mean it's written from the perspective of a woman um, who has <clears throat> an eating disorder. Many of my poems um, I think they, they. I think they, my work is influenced in them that the different voices they often can um, sound very autobiographical, but they're they're um, or self confessional. But often their experiences too from clients I've seen, and I, I think that in some way, speaking from the self, it protects. I think poetry gives a voice to that without, um, without revealing something, you know, of the confidentiality of a person. And I like that too. I, I like um, that it provides that space. So poetry in many ways supports my work as a psychotherapist. And this poem is called Enduring Utopia and it's a response to the question that an anorexic person is often asked, you know, why, why can't you eat? You know, why would you not eat a little? So this is a response to that question. Enduring Utopia. They, the soul eaters, sons, daughters betrothed to institutions have used up my womb, my son, ravaged my mind with privation. Now they want my body. I am a slave at the mercy of food, a weapon. It chokes me with their need. They think I am frail, bring plates, with teeth, wild animals attack me. I cannot tell you, as you come towards me with your large platter of nourishment, I am terrified it will eat me. That blood and its contents will soak my bones, trigger primitive instinct. My stomach refuses to digest your utopia, where the witch's flame is quenched. My gut has a voice too. She becomes a wild animal, bloated with feeling, Fat with lies, seeks revenge for the killing. She eats not just your food, your place, your power. She swallows my smile. I have built a wall of starvation. No one enters, not even me. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> I just want to um, thank the people who have supported me to um, bring this book to fruition. Mary O'Donnell, who was my poetry lecturer in NUIG, and um, David Rixby, who I met there. And then um, I owe a lot to um, Kevin Higgins. I, I attended his workshops after I um, graduated or just before I, I signed up. And I've been attending his workshops. He's given me a lot of support for this and the Over the Edge um, group writers. And it's I suppose the important thing in that as well is that there's a lot of companionship that's, you know, and connection. So that's um, that's very important when when you're alone and 
because my profession is a lonely one too, I, I work, it's very solitary. And I do enjoy my solitude. I'm, I'm very good at being alone, but, but it's important to have connection. So the next poem I'm going to read is, um, I've read our statement, um, The Tomb, Mother and Baby Home. <clears throat> and this is about the bond secures um, the two mother and babies and I was um, I was actually born in the bond secures and later when I trained as a nurse I worked there so I'm writing from, from that perspective and also I think the, what I used um, in this poem was a, the prom a prompt or what prompted it was looking at a photograph of the matron at the time I was born holding a baby and it was like the baby was myself and uh, there was something poignant in it and so I wrote this poem to mother and baby home we called it the grove where nature offered refuge I look at the photograph once cherished such innocence this nun tended me for 10 days when my mother was ill does her smile appear hard Concealed doom. The vow of silence has left us mute. All questions. Did she coerce, tyrannise? Or was her love overwhelmed by the poverty and overcrowding? So many daughters dumped in fear. What I want to know is whether these hands that once held me have blood on them. I see a gimp of starch linen beneath coif, cornet and veil, that rigid bib. I think of the vows, the blessings of the bond secures. After school, I nursed there, in that wing, where I and these babies were born. Girls, there's a shadow in this place, I'd say. We have to let the light in each time the walls enclosed us. The eerie feeling haunts. I imagine dark rooms, darker silence. But then this lover of history, Catherine Corliss, uncovers rumoured babies. She persists, reveals tiny bones, skeletal bundles and scattered remains. Young children, babies in a septic tank. <clears throat> Looking back, I shared a nursery with these babies. Their shamed mothers segregated from the like of me. What if, and if, my infant imaginary friends in babbling conversations, ghosting themselves into my life, were thrown into septic reservoirs and sewers? I look again at the picture. Neither trust nor love is possible. The arms that held children in God's name are soiled. Once more, I glance again, this time behind the nun's habit, to a dark door, obscure shadows on the wall. The baby she holds seems to look away, gazing out to the world her eyes facing the light. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. And it was um, lovely to do this. This is my book. So I said, it can be ordered at Fly on the Wall Poetry Press or Amazon or direct message me. My my launch had to be cancelled, so I really appreciate doing this and get, trying to get it out there. Um, but these things are more important things than a launch. Um, nevertheless, it's it's lovely to share this here. And I want to thank Paul again for inviting me. And I do hope in the future that I do meet, come and meet you as a group. And I look forward to that. So um, I think that's it. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening.
I am so blessed. I live in a place where the landscape is always in conversation. Legends. Well, legends are but stories that get told over and over until they become stuck in time. Some stories, though, lie buried beneath the soil, waiting to be unearthed. A story as such as this one I'm going to tell you. Buak, with his wearisome eyes and twitching nostrils, stood under the old venerable oak. Its arched branches spat raindrops onto his head. In the distance, he surveyed the new town. It was grey and walked. There was no aroma of cooking to tease the senses, for it was the Sabbath. Men were creating huge scars upon the landscape with their axes. The forests were shrinking. It seemed to Makbuch that the world had turned upside down. His ears, full and wide, two pointy triangles stood to attention. He heard footsteps. It had to be the hunter, Magrori. Once, the Irish wolf was so embedded into the Irish psyche. So much so that the Romans called Hibernia Wolfland. Now he was classed as vermin. His only value the price on his coat. In the gathering gloom of dusk, Macbulloch cast a dejected figure in the forest. Nothing stirred, nothing. Even the old woman of the forest was silent. She sat, huddled and hunched around the open crackling fire, its flames offering little heat and comfort. Once she was rich in possession of herbs and stories, now she too, like the wolf, was demonised. McBoak picked up the scent of McCrory's wolf hunt. He was in no mood for a fight. He knew what his legacy would be. He would be the last He tilted his head and saw a scent of exposed pale light lines. The two animals eyeballed one another, waiting for one to make their move. It was the wolf hound who 
launched. But Book was a strategist. He managed to get underneath the raging beast. And he ripped his throat on Shaking his shoulder, McGrory initiated his musket strap free, and he pointed it to the wolf. With one staccato shot, it was the old woman of the forest who lay in the dust. In vain, she had tried to save Macbulloch. Exploding with rage, Macbulloch hurled towards Macrory. But the hunter managed to release his knife and he plunged it straight into the wolf's heart. Mark Bullock died instantly. As the old woman lay dying, her tears watered the soil, and the wind, with its sigh, gathered the seed which had been watered by the old woman's tears, waiting for the rise of the storyteller to walk with the story. Storytellers are but memory keepers, and our stories are our treasure. You're, you're all here and most welcome. So let's go in and do this presentation. So welcome everybody to uh, this little attic room here in Ross Carberry. Um, Ross Carberry, in case people don't know, is on the Wild Atlantic Way and as you're cyclists, uh, that should be something you, you should uh, Google or check out because it's two and a half thousand kilometres from Kinsale all the way up to Donegal or Derry or if you're coming from the north from Derry all the way down here and we're right on the edge of the Wild Atlantic Way. So if you're a cyclist, check that out. I've done it a few times and it's uh, certainly worth, um, in fact, as you can see or maybe you can see, it's blue sky outside. It would be wonderful to be on a bike um, today but I'm stuck in here to do this presentation and um, very happy to do so for the cycling festival. Um, before I do and as we're talking about cycling I just want to read a short paragraph which might put us in the mood for what the, uh, the title of the presentation is. I just read this from from the book Quandam page 36 and it just describes a couple of cyclists in a room, it happens to be in, in Aswan in Egypt, um, from different countries, and we're just chilling out uh, and we're just discussing what it is like to, to cycle long distances. So just a short paragraph to set us all in the mood. Stretch on the beds we debriefed like soldiers after battle, and like soldiers 
we shared our stories, knowing only we could understand. Our journeys needed release. Each of us knew how the experience of cycling was altogether different to that of any other mode of travel. Only those who chose to walk long distance could nod their head in mutual appreciation. We agreed that a cyclist could only go so far in the sharing of experience with those who take buses, trucks, jeeps, cars, motorbikes. The intensity of being on the road, riding day after day, week after week, month after month, is different. And to get to some dreamed of distant place by one's own effort is more than mental satisfaction. It's a muscle and sinew knowing. Every metre is fairly and squarely met with, even directly gazed upon, and many are remembered intimately. The slow pace allows more to be seen, to be felt, to be absorbed. For the absence of speed means the absence of a kind of protective barrier to the extraordinary detail which one is open to when moving at 10, 15 or 20 kilometres per hour. Yet this is but the half of it. The flip side is the ease of going within, cocooned in the slow meditative rhythm of steady movement. There, a pearl is formed for the future, out of a billion bits of the seen and unseen stuff of one's passing. So a short paragraph to get us, as I say, in, in the in the mood of, of where I'm coming from, and that is, uh, the last sentence says it, a pearl is formed for the future, for, for the future, out of a billion bits of the seen and unseen stuff of one's passing. Cycling long distance um, does that. It, it, it brings you intimately into, as we know, into the, the small detail of, of places. Um, and by the way, uh, I'm not talking here about a long journey. Uh, I read some months ago about a bunch of guys who, uh, six or seven or eight of them who did a long trip. Uh, that's different. Or if you buy a ticket and you take a truck from London to Cape Town, that's different. You're in a bubble. What I'm really talking about are those girls and guys who go solo, usually, best. Uh, and go for a long distance, long enough to have that, uh, hopefully, and maybe, become a seminal experience. Um, the title of the, of the presentation was The Aftermath is Troubling, or, or And the Aftermath is Troubling. And these are not my words, these are words that I took from a letter from Ted Simon, uh, though he's not a cyclist, I'm sure most of you will know who Ted Simon is. He used a motorbike for four years. Um, and when I came back from my own trip, I wrote a letter to Ted many years ago, and I received a letter in reply, and ever since we're in touch. In fact, I spent a week in his home in the south of France uh, just three weeks ago. So we, we have had long chats, and I want to read... A paragraph from his letter, uh, which is sort of relevant. Uh, Dear John, your letter took forever to reach me. It took long enough just leaving you, I see. And I've been slow to get to it because I saw it would be a long read. Now, having got to the end, I see that it's too late to make the connection a physical one. And I'll jump to the important paragraph here. We have both been somewhere quite rare. And the aftermath is troubling. There is no packet of wisdom to be brought back from that place. We got there by dint of extraordinary and somewhat artificial means, which cannot be sustained, and perhaps we will spend the rest of our lives looking for a way back in this more mundane, natural existence. I think what Ted was, was referring to here by and the aftermath is troubling because he experienced it himself having spent four years on a triumph, um, I think it was the last triumph out of the Triumph Factory in Coventry, if I'm not mistaken. But he knew that uh, when he came back for four years, he found it extraordinarily difficult to settle into the routine of normal life. Um, 
as I did. And I count myself lucky because I know Ted and I know Dervla Murphy as a friend. And I spoke to Dervla this morning, telling her I was making this presentation, uh, asking her, well, I didn't ask her, but I, I um, wanted to. Could she make any suggestions for, for the presentation? But you don't get much out of Dervla. And she said, well, good on, you know, get on with it, she said. But to be able to talk to, to Dervla and Ted, and I have a neighbour not too far away, Tim Severn, who did that famous Brendan voyage. These are veterans of the travel game, and they know uh, very intimately what it's like to come back from, from big trips and to try and reintegrate. Um, in Ted's case, he ended up uh, starting an organic farm in California for 40 years. Uh, and that was my own case too. I wasn't following him. In fact, I was completely unaware. Um, but it it does point to when you come back, your 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 mind has opened, and you need to put that much bigger, wider experience into a box that you can live with. In Dervla's case, she just went back on the road, and she is open in saying that that she just continued travelling. She made that uh, seminal trip by bicycle in 1963. Uh, from Ireland, from Lismore to New Delhi. And that changed the course of her life. And she went on, as most of you will know, to write many books and go on many, many um, trips, long and short. And at, at 89, in fact, she's the same age as Ted Simon. They were both born in 1931. I'd love to get them to meet sometime, but that, that's another story. Um, so I'm lucky to have these people to trash these ideas out with. And um, in when I spoke to Dervla, she more or less said that, that travel for her was like an examination. And exams are topical at the moment with the COVID-19. Uh, people can't do their exams. I have a daughter who's 18 who should be doing the leaving certificate uh, in June. But all, all of these exams are, are put on ice at the moment. Um, but Dervla's point was that if you go on a long trip, it, it's really like an examination even though you don't you're not aware of it at the time but when you come back things come up for question i mean i was a biochemist working in the university hospital in cork uh, and i came back and um i don't want to say too much about this now because i'm i'm pulling the rug from another piece which you'll see in, in a few moments uh, which details that but you have to find your your new way in a way uh and i love um that Swiss travel writer, Nicholas Bovier, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, he had a lovely, uh, and if I can paraphrase it, a lovely few lines where he, uh, he says, you think you're making a journey until you discover that perhaps the journey is making you. And then time moves on, you come home, you put your life back together again, and then you realize that maybe the journey has unmade you. So you're going from making the journey to the journey making you, and then the journey actually unmaking you. And I think what, what Nicholas Bovier meant by that was that things are not the same. You can't get back into the old box or wear the same shoes. In my case, it was wearing the same white coat in the laboratory. Uh, things don't fit um, uh, as, they, as they once did after a trip. And that's how it should be. Um, it's fine. Uh, and again, I spoke to Dervla, not, not this today, but several months ago about this. And she said it, it, it is different today because we have phones, we have technology. We have, um, I spoke to a young man who uh, from this area in West Cork who was cycling on a similar route to Dervla Murphy to New Delhi from, from West Cork. And his dad wanted him to do the trip with, the minimum or minimal uh, technology so we met for a coffee in in the local town and he put his phone on the on the table and uh, i asked why he was making the trip and he said he wanted to be challenged and he wanted to experience himself he wanted to experience maybe when the shit hit the fan what he was going to do how he was going to cope um test his mind and all of these things that are very laudable and I looked at his phone. I said, well, do you think you might not uh, not take the phone or, or your, your laptop or iPad? I think was what he was going to take. And of course, his dad laughed and he looked at me as if I had two heads. Um, 
And his point was, well, of course I need the technology. And of course, I'm not against technology, but sometimes there's a conflict because often people want to go to experience something more uh, about themselves and about the journey. But obviously, if you're able to Skype your girlfriend every night or when, as I say, the shit hits the fan and you'll get lonely or uh, depressed and you can phone your mother or talk to your 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 editor or whatever, you know, that, that takes from that uh, hardcore experience, which Ted Simon and Derva Murphy, and, and I was lucky enough to experience that too, uh, before technology, you really had to dig deep and pull up something deep from within yourself to, to cope with all of that. So, but I'm sure there, there are ways uh, of dealing with that today. Um, and I just want to go on, if I may, and read another piece from Quandam. Um, and Quandam, by the way, means a period of time that has passed. So it's a period of time that is over. So Quandam travels in a once world. That once world, as I said, with, with modern technology, that world I'm describing is is, is more or less got what it is gone, you know. Um, but I want to give you a, just a flavour of... Um, of this story and how it pertains to um, a, the thought of returning home from, from something. I'm writing here about being in the Congo, of meeting a guy from originally from, uh, from Iran who is a refugee in the Congo, uh, having left Uganda to become a refugee in the Congo. This was in the mid 80s. Um, so we are, we are chatting about, about things there. And this is what, um, this is what he says. Uh, by afternoon, we reached the Catholic mission in Aru, where we hold up for a second night amid so many refugees from so many places that my grasp on what I had imagined Africa to be began to crumble. But I am refugee too, said Fami. My parents came to Uganda from Iran a long time ago. I was born there but had to flee when Idi Amin went too crazy. Now I and my brother share this truck to survive. I drive from Bunya to Buze and back again. I take whatever needs to go. Sugar, coffee, plantain, generators, fuel, timber, people. And yes, I have taken the animals too. For six years, up and down the, through this madness, I want to go home. I want to go home to Arua, but it's my way now. What else can I do? My whole family are strung out along the road from Butembu to Aru, but we are the lucky ones. We had money to begin. Most you see here have nothing but a bag of rags. Where will they go? What will they do? Some are better off dead and don't ask about the women and children. All I will say to you, my friends, it is more dangerous to be a woman here than to be a soldier. Do you understand? But how could you? Don't think about these things too much. You would only get upset. You are on your journeys. Enjoy and have a good time. And have a good time. Christ, after Fami threw that grenade, I couldn't sleep and used half the battery writing the diary. Fami never meant it, but his throwaway comment put me more firmly in my place than anything else said along the way. I knew what he meant. His life had been torn apart and he had escaped from frying pan to fire, from one dictator's chaos to another, to rebuild and make ends meet in a place as corrupt as hell. And as for the women and girls, as he said, they were being raped wholesale, and I, I would simply pass through, having my good old time. Of course, in reality, it was not the sweet and smooth good time a traveller dreams of, for there, there were days when, but then again, I knew what he meant. As for travel, what, did, what does it mean? That night I wrote in a vain though full-hearted attempt to purge confusion with words. Outside, I hear the close and distant sounds from the forest. 
the night calls from the canopy. It's very late or very early and a little realisation dawns, a little explanation why, why I travel, why perhaps we all travel in the end. I travel to be disturbed, to be shaken and woken from a kind of sleep, to be disturbed on the way to a mere taste of real freedom. In the beginning, in those first days through Ireland, Wales and onward, the rush of false freedom, of innocent freedom, swept all before it. Joyous and innocent, because the real travel still remained cocooned in the dream. Every kilometre from my father's house to Sudan was a beauteous warm-up, and if Egypt before it enmeshed me in humanity, Sudan followed with its very physical demands. But Zaire, Zaire feels emotionally my boiling pot and is shooting so many holes in my travel dream that it's deflating, thankfully, into the seedy state of raw realism. In our limited personal capsule time, we travel, and we do so within a cultural framework time infused with all that infuses the social history space of our era. We act and interpret, perceive, imagine and discuss, sealed by the roots of our own upbringing, our culture and the multitudinous limits of being a, a human sand grain in an ocean of extraordinary, unknowable experiences. What can I do with what I am being offered? What do I do with this experience? Where do I put it? How will I tell it? Where will it take me? And it goes on. The reason I wrote, read this piece was that I remember that particular time in the Congo. And though it describes a very um, harsh place, a tough place, militias, civil war, a lot of um, terrible things happening. That is the type of thing that... that pushes you at times when you make a long journey into difficult places and it forces you to to really reflect on who you are and when you come back that is an, an example really of how challenging it can be to uh, just come back. I remember uh, my own return, uh, returning to the laboratory and I remember the first Monday morning, I, I won't say the guy's name because he's still, he'd remember it, but I remember walking into the laboratory, putting on my white coat and uh, my colleagues saying, um, uh, Hi, John, welcome back. Uh, did you have a good holiday? Um, and of course, he meant it. For him, I was just gone a little while and uh, and it was just a, a long holiday. How could I possibly explain to him what I've just read? Uh, there was There's no way. So when you go on a long trip, sometimes you come back with stuff that is, is quite a challenge. To, and you've got to find some way to do it. But that's why, that's why we travel. Um, I'm going to stop reading and talking now because I've said enough. <laughs> I hope I haven't bored you. But um, in preparation for this, I spoke to my wife uh, and she said, well, why don't you put up the, the nationwide piece? And what she meant by that was just before Christmas, last Christmas, um, in on RTE, the national television station here in Ireland, uh, there is a, a program called Nationwide, and readers who read Quandam uh, got onto them. It wasn't me, and they got onto them saying that the book uh, deserved a wider readership, and the Nationwide people came here and they made a very professional piece um, documenting the backstory to to the the book and the backstory to the organic farm because eventually I did leave the laboratory uh, and that I suppose uh, was one of the consequences of making a long trip. Uh, I had to refashion who I was and decided to spend um, the last 20 years on an organic farm and I'm not the only one in doing that and by the way I'm not uh, insinuating that anybody who goes on a long trip should come back and start an, an organic farm but it, it's it's quite a good thing to do if you if you have nothing else to do um but nationwide did this so i'm going to stop here now and uh you will uh, seamlessly i hope uh, slot into the nationwide piece 
um, and that will uh, bring you to the end of this presentation. I hope it was uh, of some benefit or of some interest. Uh, but I want to finish, completely finish, with a quote from my old, um, uh, one of the great Irish writers, Samuel Beckett. And it's, it's written up here. Um, he says, perhaps my best years are gone, but I wouldn't want them back. Not with the fire in me now. Perhaps my best years are gone, but I wouldn't want them back. Not with the fire in me now. So that's of relevance to uh, people of a certain age who are reflecting back on their cycling days. And um, But there's a lot more cycling days and even better cycling the older you're you are the order we get. I think we enjoy it even more. So thank you for listening. Enjoy the nationwide peace and maybe we'll meet uh, someday. And if you're ever in this part of the world, the Wild Atlantic Way, uh, give me a shout um, and we have a spare room and I'd be delighted to meet and talk some more. Thank you. Good evening. You're very welcome to Nationwide. Later on in the programme, we'll be finding out about that Tipperary Schools Food Project. But our first story this evening takes us to County Cork to meet a man who 30 years ago left a full-time, permanent and pensionable job behind and took off on an adventure which at the time very few Irish people would have had the courage to undertake. That adventure took two years and changed the direction of John Devoy's life. We've been to Cork to meet the man and hear his story. John Devoy has always had a sense of adventure, a need to explore new horizons. Today, at the age of 62, he lives on a six-acre organic farm near Roscarbury in West Cork, along with his wife Sarah and three teenage children. You could go mad and make a chutney or something. Yeah, you could, yeah. Whether to leave them or take them down. Take out that side shoots. But as a young boy, John had dreams of travelling much further afield. Born in 1957, John grew up in Whitegate, East Cork, close to the oil refinery where his father, Thomas, worked as a mechanic. When John was nine years old, the international demand for engineers in a booming oil industry led to his father accepting a job in Libya. A Pandora's box of history, yeah. My father worked in Libya. He was there about two years. And I was a young nine-year-old. Lots of postcards came. All of that stuff that came back from Libya, not just fed into our wanderlust, it gave me the confidence to do whatever I wanted to do. In 1985, John decided to quit his job as a medical laboratory technician in Cork University Hospital to embark on his own journey of discovery. Looking for advice, he paid a visit to the pioneering travel writer Dervla Murphy, author of Full Tilt an account of her trip by bicycle from Ireland to India in the 1960s. We had a long, long conversation about travel, about adventure. I remember leaving, uh, it was late and I was cycling back to Cork and on, on the doorstep, as, as I left, she says, well, it's, it's going to be a great adventure. You go out there um, and come back with a story to share. So that's exactly what John did. Over the course of 24 months, he travelled from North Cape in Norway to Cape Town, South Africa, just himself and a bicycle. I've heard people describe, and it's common to say, we're going off-grid. I describe my adventure as pre-grid. There was no phones, there was no satellite navigation, there was no GPS, there was nothing. It's now over 30 years since John completed his epic journey. But he's only recently published the first book of a planned trilogy telling the story. So why the wait? I had to wait for years and to create some distance between the person who actually did the journey and say, that was me, that was once upon a time. 
now I understand what he did and I can tell you the story. It really needs to take its time. And working on a busy farm, day after day, 850 chickens, a few children being nurtured and grown along the way, it was a very, very busy space. Writing a book on top of all that, it was very, very challenging. John finally got the push he needed when he was asked to prepare a talk about his travels to the Roscarbery Historical Society. Being approached by the Roscarbery Historical Society really gave me the... It lit the fuse to writing the book. The more I read the letters, the more I read the diaries, the more I realised I'm ready now. Yeah, the back from Giora Biran, Haifa, Israel. The talk was in um, 2012. It was 2016 when I found him starting the book. I called to his house one day to buy some groceries from the farm and I found him hunched over the computer. John's first book recounts a section of his journey between Cairo and Nairobi. It's called Quandam, Travels in a Once World. Quanda means a period of time that has passed. To do that journey would be impossible today. And I recall describing in the book the journey across the Bayuda Desert, 300 kilometres, not very far from here to Dublin. But back then there was no road. It took me nearly 12 and a half days. You're literally driving the bike through sand. So the physical journey is, is completely different. And these are the shorts I wore. These were bought in Amsterdam, in Holland, and they were a proper cycling shorts. But by the time I got to Egypt, they began to fray. I had no choice but put patches in. And in Bunya, which is in the Aturi rainforest in the Congo, uh, it was either get rid of it or do a big job. And the tailor in Bunya uh, did this magnificent patch. So they each have memories. Alone, John faced many challenges, including a hit and run in Egypt that damaged his bike and a bout of cerebral malaria in the Congo. But the hardest part of his journey came on his arrival in Nairobi when John received a telegram from home. His father had died and been buried and John hadn't known. To hear about that at a point, in, in, in a potentially high point of John's journey, I can only imagine how crushing that would have been. So I seriously asked myself, should I return home? The embassy staff gave me all the time to communicate with my family. And I remember my youngest brother saying, and come home for what? To stand by your dad's grave? And he said, and then what? He acknowledges it himself that these are the things that are part of the risks of taking these trips. Um, and there is nothing you can do about it. You have to accept that. And I think that's the way he took it too. The support from family and friends was take the news, but continue. After finally completing his travels, it was the return to Cork and his life as a medical laboratory technician that John was perhaps least prepared for. Coming back is the hardest because you've exposed yourself to so much experience, to so much life. It is like taking 10 years of life, normal life, and squeezing it down into two. It's very hard to slot back into a nine to five. To say it's a culture shock is an understatement. And to fit back in with work colleagues who perhaps had a, a whole different perspective on their life, whole different set of values, that's extremely challenging. In 1990, John met Sarah while she was studying for a master's degree. Four years later, they got married and started a family. But he became increasingly restless in his old job. His travels had given him a different mindset. John had a desire to work outdoors, to engage with nature, and to do something that contributed to a community. So, in 1999, he resigned from his job sold his house and decided to take on the new challenge of starting an organic farm. 
John and Sarah put everything they had into their new adventure. A massive risk for a couple with a young family. It was a huge challenge because my, my wife has no farming background. So we were going into this organic farming decision. Uh, if I use the word green, we were really green. It was absolutely extraordinary, the, the, the challenges we faced. This was a greenfield site. Uh, we had to put in our water, our electricity. We often compared ourselves with the Flintstones. We were down there uh, digging holes, trying to plant 500 apple trees, thinking we were doing amazing, and then they didn't work. It was a big challenge to set up that farm. John really had to start and learn everything from scratch, but that's in the nature of the chap. He, he uh, is a very adventurous person, and he applies himself with terrific force to these things. Despite many setbacks, John and Sarah were determined to pursue an environmentally friendly approach to farming and the planet. Eventually, their perseverance paid off. The farm began to thrive, and their organic produce became a fixture in local markets, shops and restaurants. And the reason it is here, I believe, was because I more or less took the energy of the journey and I used that energy, that relentless determination, to create it. I just, I said, right, if I can travel and cycle to South Africa, I can start a farm. With his children now almost grown up, John has decided to lease the farm in order to devote more time to his writing. Life moves on, I'm 62, I've, I've written one book. The biggest job at hand at the moment is the writing of the sequel. I feel the process of writing for John is an absolute extraordinary journey. It's such an affirming, incredible thing to do. And after taking so long for John's first book, when can we expect his second? My apologies to all of those who had to wait 30 years for the first book, but I promise it will not be 30 years. It will be far, far less than that.